All right, so welcome to what is going to be the uh, last video in regards to the subject of optics. And what I want to do in this video is uh, just go through a clarification to the last video that I really should have uh, placed there, but I didn't want to saturate that video too much. We're going to review the de Broglie wavelength and the fascinating electron microscopy. And I'm going to start with my limiting resolution clarification. And again, we said that resolution was the distance at which two points could be resolved as two different points. And really, it is the minimal distance at which two points can be resolved as two different points. Hopefully, I've made that clear that the shorter that, uh, that distance between those two points, the better my resolution or resolving power would be. And we discussed the AB equation at length at the last video. And uh, this, this uh, means the numerical aperture. And we said that we can either <clears throat> decrease D, decrease my resolution distance, increase my resolving power, by increasing uh, the lambda, the wavelength, or uh, sorry, by decreasing lambda, or by increasing the numerical aperture in the denominator here. Now, obviously, because we're using light microscopy, this lambda cannot be decreased uh, indefinitely. Obviously, we're using visible light, so we have a uh, limiting resolution. And that limiting resolution <clears throat> was calculated by this AB equation for, uh, for light microscopy and a 500 nanometer uh, green light. And this is a good figure to know that the limiting, limiting resolution was 0 0.2 micrometers. And this is, uh, this is good to know because this did come up and the first self-control in 2011 and a few other uh, incidences where they asked to know what was the limiting resolution of light microscopy. And it's good to know that we do have a limit. We can't keep going down with these um, <clears throat> wavelengths to lower, to shorter wavelengths because we won't be able to see them. Okay, so now we're going to uh, review uh, the de Broglie wavelength in electron microscopy. Now, basically, de Broglie was a French physicist, and he, uh, he theorized that not only does photons, not only does light have wave-like properties, all matter has wave-like properties. That means that the uh, chair that you're sitting on right now that looks hopefully a little better than this uh, crappy chair also behaves essentially uh, as a wave. And more specifically, the electrons if I'm drawing an orbital here, the electrons and the orbitals act like waves. They have wave-like properties as well. This is uh, an easier depiction. <clears throat> and this, uh, this uh, person, de Broglie, formulated an equation by which we can resolve or we can solve for what wavelength is that particle associated with. What is the wavelength of this specific electron? Uh, what is the wavelength associated with? By taking Planck's constant, this is Planck's constant. And uh, uh, over the uh, impulse, or basically impulse is uh, mass times velocity. And we know that electrons have mass, uh, specific mass, which is almost um, a two thousandths of, of one uh, atomic mass unit. And we can increase the velocity of electrons. We can actually uh, mess around with the velocity, just like we did with our X-ray tube if we had electrons accelerated, um, accelerated from the cathode to the anode, we knew that we can, we can uh, give them more velocity by increasing the uh, voltage difference in the tube. We can create more velocity. And just by that statement, we know that we can increase the velocity. That means we can increase this whole term here. That means that this term increases and our wavelength decreases. And I remember one instance where the department asked, how can the uh, wavelength of a particle uh, be decreased by the de Broglie wavelength? And this is the de Broglie wavelength equation. And it was so calculated that electrons can be associated with a wavelength that is smaller than 0 0.005 nanometers. And if you compare this to 500 nanometers, this is quite small, and this is in the nano scale. This is in the nano scale. This is uh, a considerably uh, smaller wavelength than what we have here for green visible light. So if we in some way could incorporate 
this particle's wavelength into microscopy theoretically would be able to achieve insane resolutions. If we were somehow able to take electrons and focus them on specimens and gather information. And it just so happens that later on a discovery was made that you can focus electrons via magnets. That means that if I have if I have electron beam, let's just say it's really wide here, and I have a magnet, I have a magnet here, this is a magnet, I can focus this beam to a very, very, to a very, very narrow point. And that way I can use it to fo focus it on specimens. So in the same way that we can use, <coughs> that we can use lenses to focus light, we can use magnets, magnets, to focus electron beams. And as you can imagine, the combination or the culmination of this discovery of associating uh, wave-like properties to electrons and the discovery that we can take these electron beams and focus them via magnets gave birth to the idea of electron microscopy. And being that we mentioned the electron microscopy, it is uh, very, very fascinating. Let's, let's go through what we have here in electron microscopy. How can electron microscopy be used? <clears throat> First of all, obviously, we need to have our specimen. This is our specimen here. Perfect. Now, we already mentioned that we're using electron beams and magnets. So I'm going to put a magnet here. There's a series of magnets, but just, for the, uh, just to keep this depiction uh, fairly simple, I have this magnet here, and I have electron beams running through it. And obviously, because we have electrons accelerating in this, in this uh, microscope, and they're focused on a specimen, there needs to be a vacuum here. There has to be a vacuum. So I'm just going to write it here, um, vacuum, vacuum. And being that there is a vacuum, this specimen will not be a live biological specimen. It would have to be prepared. It would have to be prepped, and it's going to effectively be dead, you can say. You can say that this is a dead specimen. It would not be incorrect to say. But this specimen cannot be live, and it would need preparation. Perfect. So we have electrons accelerated through a vacuum, focused via magnets on a specimen. What happens next? Well, we already learned in various presentations about x-rays, etc., that electrons um, hitting material can cause different mechanisms. First of all, they can cause secondary electrons to be ejected out. Secondary electrons. They can also cause, uh, well, secondary electrons, also Auger, Auger electrons is the same, pretty much the same mechanism, you can say. We can also create x-rays, x-rays from electrons and other types of luminous photons, luminescence, or whatever way you want to spell it. And also, we can have just generally backscattered electrons. I'm just going to put it here. Generally backscattered, backscattered electrons. And you can consider all these guys to be backscattered particles. Now, these are all the interactions. All of these are all the different respectable interactions that the, this electron beam can have with my specimen. And if in some way I can put a collector here and in some way collect all this information, We'll put here, somebody collect all this information here. Maybe I can create an image. And it just so happens that when I have, when I place a collector here and I scan, uh, um, I place a collector here that scans the interactions coming off the surface of the specimen, it is called scanning, scanning electron microscopy, or SEM. So this whole portion is SEM. What you may also imagine that could happen is that we can just wait for the beam to go through or go through different scattering. We can call it uh, elastic and inelastic collision. Elastic and inelastic collision, which is basically saying if this is my sample, the beam goes through and just is just dispersed in some way on the other side. And, uh, or it can be, be uh, non-scattered. Very unlikely, but it can be non-scattered electrons. So if I have, have a way to put a collector here, I'd be able to also map it in some way. And this, is, um, and this, this uh, uh, microscope is going to be called the transmission electron microscope. 
electron microscope. We can call it TEM. And this is basically the inner working of that microscope. Obviously, you can imagine a tube here, collectors. You have a nice image uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation itself by Professor Yadosh. And also, if we're preparing ourselves, and I always, I always prepare myself for the worst case scenario of an open essay question about how, or rather explain what two phenomena led to the development of electron microscope and how it works. So first of all, the two phenomena I would have to say that led to uh, the development of electron microscope is the wavelength associated with electrons. I, can, I will go on and say the de Broglie uh, wavelength speculation associating a wavelength with particles such as electrons uh, resulting in a very small wavelength and that small wavelength could be used with the second, uh, the second element associated with the creation uh, of electron microscope, the invention of electron microscope, which is magnets, magnets that can use, uh, magnets that can be used to focus electron beams. So I already defined these two ingredients that uh, help this electron microscope come to be. And if I had to define electron microscopy, I would say electron beams are accelerated they're accelerated through a vacuum focused via magnets on a specimen. And if I were to uh, generally, uh, if I were to generally explain SEM and TEM, I would respectively say, and the backscattered particles, which could be either one of these, are collected and interpreted into an image, or the inelastic and elastic collisions that the electron beam goes goes under uh, or undergoes when it goes through the specimen can also be collected and interpreted into an image. And this is how I would answer an open essay question about an uh, electron microscope. So being that it's pretty fascinating and we're pretty much done with electron microscopy and optics, let's have a little fun. Let's have a little fun here. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, this metal foam here, and uh, don't be confused, this is a solid metal block. I got this from uh, from Wikipedia, this image from Wikipedia. And this image I got from Wikimedia, Wikimedia, of a scanning electron microscope of this metal foam here. And notice that this, this distance is two millimeters. And this is pretty staggering. If, and if you think this is good resolution, just wait. Now, this, this picture, as, uh, as, you probably, as you probably noticed or speculated by now, belongs to the, uh, uh, a leaf of the black walnut tree. And this is pretty staggering when you think about it. Picture by uh, the big picture uh, articles by the Boston portal. And they have pretty interesting stuff. And uh, this, this is the, this is the um, you can say the width, or rather the, the thickness, the thickness of that leaf. And if you think this is good resolution, if you think this is good re resolution, then take a look at this. This, this is the same leaf, and this is the thickness. So this is insane, insane resolution. And again, I want to I want to credit the pictures. These pictures are from uh, from this uh, from this portal here that uh, belongs to um, to photography enthusiasts. So if you like that, you can just go on board. I don't know if you're uh, an, uh, an scanning electron microscope photography enthusiast if you have enough money for that. But this is just something to to look at. And uh, this last one image here. Taking from the Weird Science Portal, this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, website here. This here is a snowflake. How cool is that? This is a snowflake. Perfect. So uh, pretty much uh, this is all that pertains to the scanning electron microscope. The two uh, two uh, discoveries, the two discoveries are associated with uh, with uh, the um, the invention of this microscope, the fact that there is a wavelength associated with these particles that is very very small and can be focused. These energy, uh, these electron beams that are associated with a small uh, wavelength can be focused via magnets. And this is the de Broglie wavelength. It's a, it's a very important formula to know. Or rather, I would even say, if you don't remember this, just understand it. That the more I accelerate. The more I have, if this is mass times velocity, the more velocity, the more I accelerate my electron, uh, the smaller its wavelength is going to be. And obviously, it's very important, very, very important to understand that there is a limiting resolution to a light microscope, and it is dependent on the wavelength. 
and I have my limitations. I can't infinitely decrease the wavelength or infinitely increase the numerical aperture. Hopefully you found this helpful. Thanks for sticking around. See you in the next video.